Hey everyone, I'm Mariano Parks, and today I interview Dr. Christopher De Prato, and he's going to talk about loading with cups for mobility. Dr. De Prato is a physical therapist, currently treats professional and NCAA athletes at UC Berkeley and general population at UC San Francisco while teaching in their orthopedic residency for their School of Medicine. In our discussion today, you're going to learn about the facial system and its response to injury, the effects of cupping and what research says about it, the difference between myofascial decompression and cupping, and how to use cupping as part of your treatment. If you feel this information is valuable, please consider subscribing to our channel, clicking on the bell so you don't miss anything, give us a thumbs up, and share with other clinicians you think might benefit from this conversation. I hope you enjoyed the show. PT Pro Talk podcast is only possible with the support of the forward-looking and innovative companies like Fitter First, your first choice for the best Canadian-made rehab and fitness products since 1985. Systems for PT, the do-anything, anytime EMR. Systems for PT develops systems for clinics so you can focus on your patients. Go to systemsforpt.com to schedule a demo today. Hi, Dr. De Prato. Welcome to PT Pro Talk. How are you today? Good morning, Mariana. I'm doing great. Uh, it's a beautiful day in sunny San Francisco in California here, so I can't complain at all. Awesome. Awesome. So let's uh, start talking a little bit about yourself, about your career. How did you get to where you are right now? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> definitely a different track than I anticipated going into this career. Um, I really came out of school thinking I was going to do hand therapy because the hand just was fascinating. It was just, it was brilliant. It's just such an amazing structure in such a small confined area. And then I realized that sitting across from someone on a hand therapy table and just mm -hmm. looking in their eyes and talking about their life over and over again, all day long, every day, was a little too much for me. So I, I went into the general orthopedic practice of things. Um, and I've shaped that in the next, you know, 15, 20 years. And currently I am in a physical therapy doctoral program that has an outpatient faculty practice. So we're at UCSF Medical School and two days a week I'm in clinic there. And then two days a week, I'm actually in the training room at Cal Berkeley with athletics at the NCAA level, working on uh, mostly NCAA athletes, but a lot of our pros come back and get some care there as well that play in the you know, NFL or professional swimmers or different things like that. So two days a week there, two days a week, um, in a general outpatient setting where I see all different types of things. And then that other half day, um, fortunately, I'm, I'm only doing like 80% of the uh, full-time position now because I wanted to tailor back and do a little bit more education and, and research aspects. So I get to play around in the research lab sometimes, which for us, we collaborate a lot with uh, UCSF imaging and radiology. So we've done some MRI studies on the tissue mechanics um, that is incorporated with manual therapy things. And hopefully we can talk more about that today. Yeah, so we are going to talk about uh, fascia, and I think I just wanted to start asking you, how would you define the fascial system? Absolutely. Um, and this is a big, broad topic. I think the hard part is that you have to kind of narrow down your definition into, are you talking about the cellular level and the histology of fascia, or are you talking about fascia as a general anatomical term? And um, the last three conferences so every three years there's an international fascial congress and the last three i've gone to and the last two i've presented some of our research at and it's really interesting to see some of this nomenclature shape and the new research that comes out that starts to change some of our ideas of what fascia is as our understanding and the research of you know these elements of physiology and anatomy get better um, so currently the definition on a purely global scale scale of anatomy is it's a sheet or a sheet of any type of dissectable, like aggregation of connective tissue. So it's a, a connective tissue bundle that you can feel, you can dissect, you can touch when we're talking about the anatomical form and it's beneath the skin and attaches to basically everything. So both musculoskeletal, you know, tendons, ligaments, structures to the bones, but also some of the internal organs and different things that look like that. So there's a lot of different ways of taking that, but I think as a general anatomical idea we want it to be something we can see palpate touch and dissect hopefully with a you know instrument most of the time but sometimes even taking your finger and running it through and there's a very different i think idea of fascia 
when you've worked with fresh cadavers compared to embalmed cadavers. And that's a mind-blowing experience if you've never worked with a fresh cadaver specimen to see the colors, to see the fluids still in their more natural state, right? And the problem is those cadavers only last seven days. So there's no way for us to learn anatomy over a course of a three or four month course, you know, with this fresh cadaver, because it'd be too expensive to continue to import once a week a brand new piece of tissue. So very challenging, but very beautiful. If you can ever get into a course with a fresh cadaver, I highly recommend it. That's awesome. Um, well, so let's start talking about the fascia response to injury so we can get more into the specifics. Definitely. Yeah, so I got thrusted more into this idea of fascia because I ran into manual therapy and this roadblock of mechanical changes that happened. And I'd say around 2007 to 2014, there was this big shift in our idea of what we can do with our hands. And you really see it now, like it's, it's exploded in the idea that you can't deform collagen cross bonding or fibrosis is pretty well established at this point. But we have to, again, have to take a step back and define what part of the body are you talking about and what areas of the body, because there are different responses to fascial, I think, manipulation or the ability to change fascia when you're talking about superficial things or more supple things like the fascia of your nose is very different than the fascia of your IT band. Right. And so when we think about fascia, the building blocks for these structures generally are the fibroblasts. And the fibroblasts will lay down collagen structures in response to injury because it says, hey, I have some damage here. Your satellite cells speak out and they bring in the right stuff and they try to flush out the bad stuff. And during that process, the fibroblast is laying down tracks for a scaffolding of structural kind of stability for this area. And sometimes it's very random in the way it lays it down and very disorganized because it haphazardly just launches a bunch of collagen into this area. And that's when people really need to move, right? Because that movement will decide on this organizational structure, the way the fascia should be basically organized in a parallel structure and hopefully dictated by the amount of forces that they're putting their bodies through to do that. That's the natural way, right? We have an injury. We want to theoretically move as early as you can, early mobilization and get things moving. But what do people do in our society? Often they, you know, cower in, in terms of the fear they have from that movement, or they're stuck in a splints, or they've been put in some type of ACE wrap or, you know, some type of brace and they're afraid of them. And that doesn't really allow for, I think the fibroblasts to lay down the collagen and have that organizational input so that you can now restore optimal function in terms of tensile strength and mobility, right? Because we want collagen to be thick and sturdy. We want it to be very strong, but we want it to be very parallel in its organization in terms of the directional movement that you prefer as a human body, right? That's the strongest tensile strength is something that's very parallel and very kind of flexible, kind of like a suspension bridge is the way we describe it. Those cables aren't all haphazardly shoved all over the place. They're very linear and parallel in their organization. So that's an optimal way. But again, what do we do in our kind of allopathic medicine model is we shut it down, we stabilize it, or we put it in a brace, or we tell them not to move for two weeks, or we put it in a sling, and then we throw a bunch of drugs at it, right? NSAIDs, and, and try to shut down inflammation because it hurts. And you're not actually allowing that fibroblast to do its job and get the things out that it needs to get out from a metabolic standpoint, get the right things in when we think about that response to injury. And how can we affect uh, the fibroblast? Since you, you mentioned like being stuck in a position, so what can we do as physical therapists? And is there like a time frame that we can act that's optimal? And then if past the time, like how does that work? Absolutely. So the coolest thing, uh, and, the, and the reason I really went into the research world a little bit more is because like some of the things that we learned, I, I learned these things 20 years ago, right? And some of the things we learned have kind of been washed away and have been revamped with this new idea of mechanical load stimulating the right amount of collagen to be deposited and hopefully like i said the right organization of those structures but then we also have this other stuff that comes in that needs to lubricate the area to make sure that we can continue to move and glide the way we're meant to so i think the primary role again is to get people moving as early as possible with as pain-free emotion as possible so they don't have fear avoidance 
but then making sure that you're starting to tissue load as soon as you can because satellite cells will bring in things to try to eradicate you know some of the damage done and bring in the right macrophages that you know b cells and and the fibroblast excitation within three days of an injury right so the primary window of that time frame that's optimal is anywhere from seven to ten days that's your optimal proliferation and if you remember back to our healing phases right they overlap a lot but you have that inflammatory response and then you have a proliferative phase and then you have a remodeling phase right and that proliferative phase is really where your fibroblast is the most active meaning you're going to have the best bang for your buck at that seven to ten day mark you know plus or minus a lot of times depending on the body depending on the age depending on how much they move or are used to moving but that's that window because by usually 21 to 28 days you have a mature scar that's how long it takes it's not very long at all and the problem with i think especially in the physical therapy realm is that it takes us a whole week to get our insurance authorization and another two weeks or three weeks to get into the CME. And now you're already 30 days out of your injury and I'm trying to help you already with one hand tied behind my back because we missed that window of opportunity for that proliferative phase to really affect, again, organization and tensile strength from the loading that you're trying to signal to this area to make sure that it's going to move the right amount and, and try to stimulate that organizational effect. That's what I was going to ask you. So let's say we miss that opportunity, that window, which I think it's very common, taking in consideration how long the patient takes to, first of all, go and see a doctor and get a referral and all of that. So then um, if we get them later than this phase, how do you do you think like our results are considering all of that? Do you still think you can get good results if you load the tissue, even that it's a little bit later or how, how does that work? This is a beautiful question. And, and the real answer is we're still figuring it out, you know, to be honest. Um, but what's, I think an opportunity for us to dive into the histology of things and, and the cellular mechanism of fascia, right? Manual therapy has pushed away this macro effect and the idea that you can't change fibrosis and you can't distort an IT dam and because it takes so many newton meters but we're not really talking necessarily about that first 30 days or 45 days or 60 days and sometimes you're still in a fresh enough place that you can switch from an early remodeling phase maybe at 35 or 40 days back into an inflammatory phase by stirring it up right that tissue is not matured so far that you can't get it to go from a proliferative or remodeling phase back into an inflammatory phase by getting them to load a little bit heavier or go into that range of motion a little bit more or stimulate some of that signaling with something like a instrument assisted tool or for what I like to use the most is a negative pressure device called cupping, right? So there's so many ways of trying to distort some of that tissue enough to bring it from a remodeling phase back into an inflammatory phase and hopefully start that process all over again in a more organized and more programmed way, right? We want to load them earlier, but we have to stir it back up again to get that process to go in the right direction instead of that shutting down that they did for the first 30 days because that's what their you know primary care medicine doctor told them to do. Stay in that sling for the next four weeks and then you could start moving it gently. Well, probably should have been moving it at day five, at day seven, at day 10, right? And that's really the important part. And then loading it as soon as possible when that pain-free motion is available. And before we start talking about the cupping, I have a question about that that you mentioned. But let me just go back a little bit. Uh, because you talk about lubricate, right? Because you have the, the fibroblasts that they you work with load to remodel um, the tissue. And then I know I watched your presentation and you mentioned a presentation you, uh, you did, I think, in December, right? that you sent me about the fascia sites. So is that the the ones uh, responsible for lubricate? Because you, I think you mentioned that it's super important the, the load, the structure, and then to lubricate. So you have that, that movement, the move and glide, right? Would you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so if you've never heard of this cell called a fascia site, it was only discovered in 2014. So there's this group in Italy and Padua University they have an amazing orthopedic surgeon and anatomy professor named Carla Stecco. She was really one of the leaders in this idea or understanding of fascia. 
Um, she actually has a brother named Antonio Stecco, and he's a physiatrist at NYU and, and other places as well. And they're kind of like a powerhouse family of, of understanding fascia. She works more on the histology side. And they found this cell that they didn't ever know existed prior to 2014 and really started understanding its functional ability in like 2016, 2018. And what they're seeing is that's the cell responsible for hyaluronic acid content. And if you don't understand when it comes to the musculoskeletal system and connective tissue, hyaluronic acid is the lubrication between the fibers that allow for normal slide and glide. And this really, I think in the next five or 10 years is going to be the small mechanical ticket to understanding the response of the body to manual therapy. It's not about breaking up collagen cross bonding like we thought 20 years ago. That's kind of been disbruised. But this other opportunity to understand fluid dynamics, and that's where the power of manual therapy is, it's the fluid dynamics in that local area. And that fluid dynamics says, well, I don't care if you use a bike to warm up or a heat pack or a manual therapy technique or a scrapey tool or a cup. I just want to improve the viscoelastic properties of this tissue to improve that gliding and sliding of those tissues. And I think in the next five to 10 years, we're going to appreciate that's probably that little bit of biomechanical, like important, like properties that are in those tissues that manual therapy does happen to stimulate pretty well because it's fluid dynamics, right? But that's why it doesn't have to be so specific. Like we don't need any specific type of manual therapy. You can use your knuckles or you can do an ART technique, or you can use a scrapey tool, or you can use a cup, or you can just have the patient move and lay on a foam roller. All these things improve for a short period of time, that local viscoelastic property of the tissues to improve sliding and gliding. And the kind of currency of that is hyaluronic acid, because that's the fluid film between your different fascial layers, between the muscle fibers, which we call epimycea and the perimycea, right? So that's where I think the exciting area of manual therapy is going to be understood when we talk about the mechanical properties. I still think the neurophysiologic is the most important. But we do want to appreciate there are some things going off physically when we do things to tissues. But it doesn't have to be so specific as we used to think of when, you know, I took an ART class 15 years ago or 10 years ago. And you had to be very specific on what you did. And the technique was so important. And I forgot half of the things I would learn in my manual therapy classes and still do them. And they still worked, right? I did a bunch of mulligan courses. And like, I went back to go try it the, you know, the Monday after taking the course. And I tried the technique and it worked beautifully. And then I went back to my notes to see, like, did I do it right? And I'm like, oh crap, I did it exactly the opposite of what I was supposed to do, you know, but it still worked. So I, I think our idea of manual therapy doesn't have to be so specific. We're starting to see that a lot more, but we also still should appreciate there are some biochemical things going on that we haven't understood until very recently. And that's that fascia side, I think, understanding that is going to develop more and more in the next five to 10 years. Yeah, it, it makes sense. And it, that, that I think would impact more on the range of motion, I would assume. Like if you if you lubricate and you have that moving light, maybe you can get that range of motion that you're having trouble improving, right? I think we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Let me not go ahead on myself. Uh, um, so let's just start talking about the cups. Um so what are the effects of the suction on the skin and what does research say about cupping therapy? Totally. So let me give you the quick, quick and dirty, like origin story of cupping and physical therapy. Um, it really, I've been practicing since 2003 and you didn't really see this at all, at all at all prior to like 2012, 2014. Um, we really developed a lot of this stuff at Cal Berkeley using movement driven use of cupping uh, with our athletes. Because basically when I got to Cal, I had been working with some acupuncturists and I really liked the idea of cupping, but they never moved the body when cups were on. I was like, well, why aren't you moving? Like that's gonna help glide and slide some of these tissues. It makes total sense that you're pulling on something that's very adherent and sticky, right? Scar tissue or you know, post mastectomy cording or uh, burns and things. It's very, you know, sticky tissue, very glued up if you want to use like a lay term. And when you pull on something that's like that, it makes a lot more sense in terms of that slight glide properties of those areas. I was like, well, you have this amazing cupping thing that you're doing, but you're not maximizing your benefit out of it because you're not moving. 
And I started using it a lot with athletes. This was back in like 2008, 2009. And I used a lot of movement and I found that like they really not only got a better range of motion effect, but their pain modulation was really managed a lot better. And so when I started using it, it was more because I wanted to save my hands. I was working on 330 pound offensive linemen at, at Cal football. And like these were big people. And I, I really used it to kind of, you know, give them a little bit of that manual therapy they were looking for, but still try to shift their, I think, uh, you know, progress towards, well, let's get you better programming and get you loaded more consistently so you can get back to the sport that you want to do. Because my background's in strength conditioning. I love strength conditioning things. And my focus wasn't manual therapy. That's what they wanted. But I wanted to like dangle the carrot to get them to go into this loading progression. And that was a ticket that really helped me because they wanted the thing they're used to, right? A hamstring soft tissue that would take 20 minutes usually. And I could use cups and it would take three, four minutes. And they would have kind of the same effects that I would be using my elbow for 15 or 20 minutes on these big athletes for. So that's really where all that started for me. And, and then I got to a literature search and trying to understand it. This is way before I started doing faculty with UCSF. And I didn't find very good literature at all on cupping. It's really bad because everything prior to about 2014 was all geared towards pain modulation. Most of it, when you think about pain modulation, is gonna, it's for sure going to have terrible outcomes when you think about a systematic review or meta-analysis because pain is so complex. And pain, I don't think, is the right target for a tool like myofascial decompression or cupping or whatever you're doing with their instrument assisted tool stuff. I think that neurophysiologic effect is really what you should be shooting for mostly. And like I said, the viscoelastic properties of the, t the tissues there. So what I would do is I would take a cup and during somebody's rehab for a high hamstring tendinopathy, I wanted them to do single leg RDLs. They didn't want to do single leg RDLs. And I would have to encourage them by saying, okay, let's see what your pain-free range of motion is. And they would do it and they wouldn't go very far. They'd be holding, you know, maybe a 20 pound kettlebell. And then I put one or two cups on their high hamstring or mid hamstring kind of muscular tennis junction. And I'd say, okay, do it now. And they could actually go further into the range of motion in the exercise than they could without the cup. So that's really where I started using a lot. And I think it really blossomed into the use of cups on the Olympic level. Cause a lot of our swimmers at the time were really good swimmers getting gold medals and stuff. And so that got thrusted into kind of the professional sports realm. And, you know, when something hits professional sports, everybody wants to talk about it. Everybody wants to try it. Um, and so it really started taking off in 2012 2000 to 2016 with Major League Baseball, the Olympic team um, sports, and then started working with some NFL teams in 2015, 2016, 2017. So that's really, I think, you start seeing this more. And it just happened to coincide with, you know, Facebook blowing up things and now Instagram blowing up things and now, you know, TikTok's going up things the wrong way sometimes. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions, but physical therapy really started using this with movement in a very small controlled way, not 50 cups on somebody's back and always with motion. And that's really where the origin, I think, of this in physical therapy kind of has grown out of it. And it's very different than traditional Chinese medicine because traditional Chinese medicine uses a meridian system and puts many cups on the body and has them in a prone, usually passive position for 15, sometimes 20 minutes. And that's not actually what the literature says is probably the most effective way of improving this elasticity or blood flow to different areas. And we can talk about that research too a little bit. Yeah. And since we're talking about the movement, is there a difference, for example, if I apply the cup cupping and I move it through the, 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 the patient and the patient active moving? Is that a big difference between the two techniques? Yeah, because I always want the patient to move as soon as possible. So as soon as you can, you want to make it an active modality or a multimodal thing. If you're thinking about it in the context of trying to get them to move or load, right? If you're trying to improve range of motion, if you're trying to improve tensile strength in the area, you probably don't want to be moving the cup up and down on them. You want the cup in the stationary place and have them do the movement because that's way easier to empower someone to move more. And then probably also for them to do it to themselves, you know, six months later when they felt like this was really something that helped them get over a hump of irritability or, you know, fear avoidance that they had, they could do it to themselves. I mean, cupping devices on Amazon are $10. Like 
you can do this very safely and effectively to yourself. And that's what I try to do with a lot of my athletes is, all right, I'm going to do this to you. And then, you know, you're going to get over this injury. And if you ever need this again, this is that $10 Amazon set. You can buy this for yourself. Don't do it more than you need to. Just use it judiciously. And, you know, they can do it for themselves once a month or whenever that like small thing comes up that has been bothering them. So the, you use more the cupping stationary and then the patient moves. That's usually the way you, you use. Yeah. So we really, we really have geared it towards that because you can enter loading tissues so much faster that way, right? If I'm doing the gliding on the tissues with the more passive approach, A, they're going to get a little more dependent on that and B, they're not moving and I want them to move and load as soon as possible, right? So that's really where we steer different from this idea of cupping. And I really came up with the term myofascial decompression because I wanted to steer away from passive traditional cupping because it's a very different art and science, I would say. Um, we're really gearing it towards movement and loading. And it's not always range of motion that you need because some people come in and they have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, right? And they have hypermobility. And I still sometimes want to use a cup to chill out their nervous system while they're loading. And that really helps them feel more in control of that joint space or that joint uh, articulation area in terms of that movement pattern that they're having a, a hard time with, right? So it's not necessarily that you just are working on it for range of motion because a lot of times persons with hypermobility disorder have a ton of range of motion and they still respond well to something like this because I can enter into a loading phase much quicker. Okay. And when you say that you start using this term myofascial decompression, the difference from cupping is that if you think about cupping, you think more about like a passive approach and then the myofascial decom decompression is more the active approach with the cupping. Is that right? Totally. And if you see, you know, Instagram posts these days, you will see a very distinct difference between people that are using an active approach with one or two or three cups versus a passive approach where they're often using 10 or 15, sometimes up to like 40, 50 cups at once, right? And so on our Instagram, we have a what the cup Wednesday, like what the hell are people doing with these cups sometimes? Because it doesn't make any sense, right, from a mechanical standpoint or a neurophysiologic standpoint. Um, really, we feel that we set this direction of myofascial decompression towards early loading and early movement and move more as often as possible and as many planes as possible and as much variation as you can. And that's really kind of tying what we're thinking is the most important part of this technique of, of using cups, right? Not necessarily the cup themselves. The cup doesn't really matter much. It's the power of your intervention on the physiology and that neurobiology of like what the person's going through. I think it makes sense. I like this idea of like trying to make them move quicker, faster, and pull low. Because I think that everything that goes from passive to active, I think it makes a lot of sense because you're encouraging the patient to move and take control and empowering them versus just giving them the passive techniques that they're going to maybe become dependent and you're not going to have that great of the results. So I, I like that idea of being active and combining that with movement, uh, with cupping. Absolutely. Seems to work a lot better. Yeah, it, it's great. You know, and in, in a private practice setting, if you've never worked in a hospital-based system or somewhere that it really encourages low utilization of visits, you never know that this is on your radar, right? Like in private practice, we want to see the person twice a week, sometimes three times a week from a business model. Is that the best thing for their improvement or their outcome? No, it's, it's a business model, right? And so I was unaware of this until I got to a place that was like, well, we really look at, you know, utilization of visits and we'd love for you to see someone and have an average, you know, visit per case of five versus a private practice of visit per case, maybe like 12 or 14 or maybe more, unfortunately. And so you have to get very efficient in those types of models, whether it's an HMO like Kaiser in California, this place called Kaiser, you know, or other places that have a lot of pressure for you to see people and get them on their way to be independent. And when you start diving into what really works, well, early movements, early loading and empowering that 
person to be able to do as much as they can on their own and helping them along the way by decreasing their fear, right? And the cups, when you use it like that, really help expedite that process. And that's how we use them a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And when you apply, do you apply them differently if you are targeting a tendon versus a muscle, for example? Mm, that's a great question. So again, when I started using cups, there was very little literature on understanding the mechanical effects that are happening from this decompression effect. There was like one article in 2006 that talked about the bowel engineering of like the cup pressure going down and the negative pressure filling up. And they talked all about where the, you know, surface area was having the most forces and things like that, but they didn't say anything about the pressures needed to affect which layer of the body. So if you think about the layers of the tissues that you're trying to affect, you have your outside epidermis, right? And then you have your like fat cells and hypodermis, and then you have your deep fascia. And then you have the epimyceum covering the muscle, and then you have fascia within that muscle. And there's very different specific pressures that will affect different parts of those layers, depending on how much pressure you're using. And I had no data on that because it had not been done at all. And so that's really what we've been focusing on at UCSF with using radiology and histologic understanding of like, what are these tissues? What's going on with some of this? And what layers are we affecting with which pressures? And so we did a lot of MRI studies because diagnostic ultrasound studies are kind of interesting, but you have a high rate of bias because just pushing a little more pressure on a probe, you can really change the amount of space in something as you know superficial as getting down to your deep fascia. So we've done MRI studies because they're totally repeatable. Anybody can go back and repeat these and see exactly what we saw because it's a picture in that time and frame of having a cup on and taking the cup off and then seeing what happens to the tissue afterwards. So we had to do a bunch of different body parts because different parts of your body have different amounts of thickness, right, of superficial and deep fascia before you get to the muscle. So we've done now nine or 10 different body parts, uh, you know, like upper trap, rotator cuff, uh, lumbar spine, TFL, IT band, hamstring, uh, just a lot of different regions of the body to understand what are these mechanical effects and how are they different from one region of the body to the other and how much pressure does it take to get to which layer. And what we found is that really low pressures can be just fine for something like getting to your deep fascia. But if you want to get into the muscle and affect the fascia between your muscle fibers, that's going to actually require at least probably 200 to 250 millimeters of mercury. And so that's really important to know. And and to see what those pressures are, we've kind of developed this pressure gun that has a dial on it that shows you how many millimeters of mercury you're generating onto these tissues. And that's, I think, some, some of that forward thinking that's going to push, I think, the idea of this into a much more objective place. And do you feel like now you're talking about fascia and muscle and how deep they are? If you are impacting the fascia, you are consequently impacting the muscle as well or you feel like you have to go that deep you know because the i mean they're all connected so i was just wondering does it make a difference if you go like deeper to get to the muscle or just if you go to the fascia it will be enough to have a good result totally great question and i would say 80 percent of the time you can go very uh, superficial and very light and get the effects you're looking for because fascia connects everything down deep right? The fascia that's in your like deep fascia and superficial layer continue down into the fascia of your muscle. It's all contiguous, right? So you don't need a lot of fascia, especially, especially if you're trying to affect the neurophysiologic system. So if you're trying to change the mechanoreceptors that are in your deep fascia or even the superficial fascial layers at your dermis, right? Or pressure or light touch, all those things, you don't need very much pressure at all, right? You're talking about 100 millimeters mercury. Very easy and easy for them to move. But what if you have a hamstring tear because you're a soccer player and that hamstring tear is deep inside your mus you know, um, your semitendinosus muscle? Well, you're going to have to actually distort that tissue with enough pressure to get to that layer to improve the slide glide at that layer. Because, right, the body is going to take the path of least resistance. If I have a light pressure on my semitendinosus muscle and I don't have enough pressure to pull on the muscle, I'm going to be getting a lot of slide and glide on the things superficial to it, but not affecting that particular scar area where that strain was, that say, a grade two strain of that semitendinosus. 
So you do at times have to get to those areas. But if you're just going for a neurophysiologic effect, no, you don't. So it really depends on the goals of what you're trying to achieve, right? And that's where the clinical decision-making comes in, right? And that's, that's where having a little bit of understanding of data, which pr pressure affects which tissue, and what is my actual goal, really going to determine my, the, the look of my intervention. Yeah, it makes sense. And when you're talking, we are talking about the fibroblasts and fasciocytes and the load and lubricate, lubric, lubricate, um, so what, what does the cupping do in that situation? It just facilitates the process because of the decompression of the tissue? Like how would you explain the, the effects of the, the cups with the movement? Yeah, again, complicated and, and to be transparent, we don't have all the answers yet. We are slowly uncovering puzzle piece by puzzle piece. But I think the thing that our lab has done is back in 2015, we were the first group to ever take a picture of a cup on the body in vivo inside the MRI. So we put it on somebody, put them in the MRI with the cup on and took a picture of what that looks like. And we are like blown away with how much distortion of this was on the upper trapezius how much distortion of the upper trapezius as well as the supraspinatus beneath it. Because like you said before, you don't need necessarily a lot of pressure to pull up a superficial muscle, but a deeper muscle you do. And we found that with 450 millimeters of mercury, I could pull actually supraspinatus up a little bit as well, not just the upper trapezius. And so that was a kind of groundbreaking, eye-opening thing. And then what we had to figure out from there is like, how long did these effects last for? So we put somebody in an MRI took a picture, pulled them out, put a cup on, put them back in the MRI, took a picture, pulled them out, took the cup off, put them back in the MRI. This is about 30 minutes later and took another picture. And so the immediate effects really show the space changes at least 30 minutes to 45 minutes after the intervention of improving that slight glideability of those tissues because you have so much more space for them to move and glide with, right? We really change a lot of the viscoelastic properties of those tissues when you use a cup. Now, I don't think we have this understanding for a lot of the other tools that we use out there, whether it's like a, you know, scraping instrument assisted Graston tool or a vibration tool. Like what does that look like from a percussion gun? I think this type of research really needs a lot more focus to understand what are these biomechanical effects that are there? Because I can show you the pictures of what happens before and after. And the longest we've gone so far now is 72 hours after we've taken people with IT band syndrome, put a cup on their IT band at the lateral femoral condyle, brought them back three days later, and there's still a statistically significant distance effect that's different than it was prior to the intervention. So again, we can't just throw away all biomechanical effects. I know that's what a lot of the pundits in the manual th or the anti-manual therapy kind of rooms are doing currently. There are some mechanical effects that happen from manual therapy. It's just not as robust as we thought. And it's definitely not affecting collagen cross-bonding. I think it's affecting, again, fluid dynamics. And that's really kind of why it doesn't matter to be so specific. You just want to do whatever that particular client is going to be most empowered with during that time. Oh, that's very cool that, that you're trying those things and seeing the results 72 hours later. And you still got some change. That's very cool. Um, and, and that you mentioned that helps on the gliding, right? Because you have more space. So if you think about like tandems, for example, when you're trying to organize collagen, do you feel like that, do you have anything, something similar like that to show, like, how can we improve that by using cupping? Yeah, that's great. Uh, we haven't gotten there yet. Like a lot of these studies are super expensive. So one subject cost me about $1,600, right? So like our IT band study was eight knees and that was an expensive study to get eight knees done um, because we had to take MRIs and bring them back three days later and take MRIs again. It's very expensive. So a lot of what we've done is, is more pilot study aspects. Um, hopefully they can be repeated with diagnostic ultrasound and things, but thinking about something like carpal tunnel, right? Carpal tunnel will be such an easy study to measure the space, measure the nerve conduction velocity, put a cup on, have them, you know, do one treatment per week for three weeks with this cup and have them have a whole exercise program with it. 
and you have a cohort that gets the cup, then you have a cohort that doesn't get the cup, and measure their nerve conduction velocity six or eight weeks later, and see if there's a difference between the two. I think that's a very simple area, like you're trying to say, like, you know, what's the effect on a tendon, or what's the effect on a neurodynamics, right? When we think about the slide glide of that nerve inside that space. Well, if it's a space issue, this is a great tool to improve your space. And when it comes back to tendons, is say you're treating someone's patellar tendinopathy. Well, those lesions are often on the posterior aspect of the tendon, right? It's not on the tendon that you can touch. It's not right on the front of the knee. It's on the posterior aspect, right? On the inferior pole of the patella. So you need enough pressure to distort those tissues to improve that side glide, which is very challenging. Same thing with high hamstring tendinopathy. It's often a, a more medial and in the kind of anterior portion of the tendon in that case where the, you're starting to see that mucoid degeneration of the tendon itself. So you need the right amount of pressures and, and the right amount of timing to be able to kind of see changes with it. I was just thinking maybe with being able to slide and glide better, you give them more mobility so you can put more load by that effect. Maybe you, 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 you're able to increase the load. Absolutely. In the grand scheme of things, that's all that matters, right? But in the research world, we're trying to narrow down what is the variable that we are having some effect on and, and how can we objectively measure that pre and post. So in the research world, we have to get a lot more specific than that. But I think in the clinical world, you hit it on the head. Do anything that makes them load earlier with less pain and less fear. That's all that matters. And for me, like I'm in California, I can't do needling. I used to do needling in Colorado. I liked it. I didn't, I didn't need it every time, but here in California, we can't do any dry needling. So the cup is my choice of like empowering them, getting them moving that into that kind of uh, higher loads faster with more movement opportunities, right? That's what I look for. Uh huh. Yeah, absolutely. And we are talking a lot about mobility, but like pain wise, do you see results maybe by improving mobility? you reduce pain or anything related specific uh, to pain? Would you treat, let me, let me rephrase it then, would you treat it for pain rather than range of motion restriction? Yeah, you could. Um, I prefer to chase pain with other tools than a cup. I think education is my primary tool for pain modulation. I think teaching people what's safe and what's not safe, it reduces their anxiety and their fears and they can move in a more pain-free range of motion. So when it comes to pain, that is not my first line you know, defense for someone coming in with, with pain. I think it's something that I'll pull out fairly early to improve their confidence in their ability to move through pain or move in a more pain-free range. So from that standpoint, if you have chronic you know, neck pain, I will probably use a cup at some point on somebody's levator scap at the, you know, superior angle of the scapula, or I'll do it somewhere along the lateral portion of the upper trapezius and have them do a row with some resistance, right? I'll do some strengthening while I have the cup on, because that for me is the most important thing is early loading as often as possible and as many planes as possible. So I almost never put a cup on and say, I'll be back in five minutes, right? Only if I need coffee in the morning real bad. But most of the time, I want to be doing something active with them. And the beauty of the cup is the cup is doing what my hands used to have to do from a manual therapy standpoint. And I get to focus on verbal cueing for technique or positioning or, you know, the posture that they're using while they're doing this exercise or making sure that they're going through a full range of motion and encouraging them, right? I can use my energy now to encourage them to move with more confidence instead of my energy spent on the tissues and beating up tissues with my knuckles or my elbows or my whatever. That's the, that's why I use the cup more than anything else is that it frees up my time to, I think, improve the rapport build with the client and improve their, um, expectations of what they can do. So that they feel like they can accomplish what they're, they're trying to accomplish. Yeah. So you use more like as a tool to, to assist your treatment. So it's not like your treatment is, is in cupping. You use the cupping to help you treat the patient with the different techniques, movements, whatever you're usually doing. Absolutely. That's the goal. Because my world, right, two days a week, I'm in athletics where 
people need results instantaneously to be able to perform uh, an event or get into their practice. And they need instantaneously change ideas of their self-confidence. And if you don't provide something in that window of opportunity for them to practice or perform at their sport, you're not going to be very helpful for them in that moment, right? So I always want them to feel more confident at the end of the session. And the cup just gives me a little bit more of a window of opportunity into that so that they can get to the place they're trying to get to quicker. Awesome. Awesome. And now just thinking about other in other situations that you use as part of your treatment, is there anything else like different than to what you already mentioned that you want to just give us as an example of something that you would use cupping uh, that maybe we're not thinking right now about? Yeah. Um, I think for me, it's in athletics, it's very easy to see a lot of applications for ankles, improving dorsiflexion range of motion before they go do their back squats, right? Before they go into a loaded pattern and they want to go into a deeper back squat, you could put cups on the soleus or gastroc. And specifically, I always try to target the space between one muscle and another, right? That epimyceal layer between muscles, that's where you're going to have the best bang for your buck because that's where the most hyaluronic acid content is going to be. That's going to be improving the slide glide of those tissues. So I'll do that on the soleus or Achilles or gastroc before they go and they lift and their dorsiflexion range of motion will increase significantly when I measure like a dorsiflexion needle wall uh, measurement with a tape measure or an angle. So I can use it kind of prophylactically to prep them for something that they feel either stiff or not prepared for in two minutes, right? Because these techniques that I like to use, two to four minutes are done. This isn't traditional cupping where you lay down for 10 or 15 or 20 minutes. You put it on while they're doing a warm up. It doesn't cost very much. And over time, they can start doing this for themselves. And that's really, I think, what we stand for with myofascial decompression because we're trying to make them less dependent on us and more resilient for themselves to kind of go and do this thing. And then if they see results, they can just go home and repeat themselves. Exactly. Yeah. Very, very simple with that. And the other thing is, so here in San Francisco, we're filled with tech, right? We're in a place of amazing brains coming together and engineering the future of like kind of what this whole internet experience is going to look like. And they're very educated and very well read. And they've seen plenty of people that have talked to them about the basics of injury. And they have very high expectations for that. So this tool is something that I can use as a unique experience for somebody that's read WebMD and they've read, you know, all the physio blogs on this injury that they have because, you know, they haven't done a proper kind of building of strength going into the things they're trying to do. And they see a difference on what their capacity is in that moment. And they're very excited to listen to me, to tell them to slow down and program the right way. Right? So this is like that buy-in rapport yeah. build uh -huh. that they feel something different and they trust you instantaneously because they're like, wow, we took my pain away, right? In that moment, it's going to come back, right? And I'm going to educate them on what that looks like and why they should continue to maybe move through some of the discomfort and maybe some of the things that you should watch out for and not move through those discomforts, right? Or those kind of things. But that's what you need to get them to be compliant with the treatment. So that's awesome. Um, before we transition to the final questions, I know we, we talked a, a lot about a lot of different things. Do you want to mention anything else to wrap up the scoping part and then we transition to the final questions? I, I think, you know, overall cupping gets a really bad rap <laughs> in the physio world because they look at traditional cupping. And I think if you listen to some of the principles of what I was talking about, it's it's kind of irrefutable that putting a cup on someone while they're doing something that was painful and improving their capacity to go through a bigger range of motion or add more load to that exercise that you're trying to get them to do, it, it's a great tool, right? You don't have to think about it as, I don't use it for blood flow. A lot of traditional cupping is it's used for blood flow and blood flow. I, I put them on a bike for blood flow, right? I, I haven't used an ultrasound in, in the last 10 years. I haven't 
done anything from a passive mobility standpoint for blood flow in a long time. And that includes cupping. I don't use cupping for blood flow. There's so many better things for that. I'm using it for local tissue effect, trying to prove viscoelasticity and fluid dynamics in the area when we think about the hyaluronic acid slide glide properties. And then I'm really using it to build rapport and improve the confidence in them, their ability to kind of move through things. And that's really, again, the big distinction between traditional cupping and myofascial decompression. So that's really kind of what we've geared towards with this type of tool. Yeah. And I think it's a very important distinction because I think most people use that in that passive way. I haven't seen or heard many people using that with movement. So I think it's very important to make it very clear the differences and the the the, the goals of e using each approach, right? I mean, it's changing. Social media has is, is brought everything to the forefront of, of the options, right? And so our cup therapy Instagram, like you can see the difference on that compared to other cupping things. You know, cup therapy, we, we came up as, with that name because nobody can spell myofascial decompression, right? And so nobody could find the website myofascial decompression. So our website is just cuptherapy.com instead of the bigger word because nobody can spell. So unfortunately, um, so we try to use that term with our athletes, cup therapy, instead of cupping because they can understand it better. Instead of using big words, we want to use terms that people can understand and make, and make it simple. Absolutely. I can say my official decompression, so I'm good. You <laughs> can use it, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just, um, I think it defines it better, but, you know, people yeah, can't yeah. necessarily yeah. understand it. Absolutely. <laughs> and people that want to learn more about the the everything that we just talked about, do you have any resource of information, anything that you recommend them to read? Absolutely. So, again, I think the top authors, if you want to go out and just look at some of these authors' work, um, Carla Stecco and Antonio Stecco are probably some of the top, I think, fascia, fascia uh, the fascia sites sell some of those things that are really more groundbreaking. So it's, again, we don't understand exactly how that's going to translate into clinical outcomes. We don't know how much that's playing a role, but we can really appreciate what it does from a physiologic standpoint. Uh, the other big author is Robert Schleip and he... Half of his stuff is really good and half of it's a little bit out there. It's a little more fringe, a little bit more on the kind of psychology, emotional component of fascia, right? People talk about maybe their psoas and how you're storing your, you know, traumas and injury in fascia. And I don't believe any of those things really. I think there are tissues that you will feel different things in depending on, you know, how you experience individually fear or anxiety or you know, sadness, those, those are, those are real experiences, but I don't think it's stored in your fascia. I think it's something that's been taken out of context, but this author, Robert Schleip, he has some very interesting things. And the big study that they cite often about not being able to deform fascia came out of 2007 or 2006. It's Chandry is the primary author, C-H-A-N-D-R-Y, I think, Chandry. And Schleip is one of the authors on the same paper that people cite every time they want to bash manual therapy, but they don't understand that these were fascial researchers that were trying to understand the differences between things like your IT band and the fascia of your nose. And the fascia of your nose does distort very differently than the fascia of your IT band. So we've got a black and white answer of you can never do anything to fascia with your hands from a manual therapy standpoint. And we have to just kind of realize there's a lot of gray zone with that. So. I'd say those are some of the, the better authors to kind of look at. Um, Carla Sticko actually also has a book called The Functional Atlas of the Fascial System, and it's a beautiful resource, I think, if you really want to dive deep into the, the areas of fascial research and histology and the anatomy of kind of the, the sections that they've done with that. It's really beautiful. And I remember I saw the pictures uh, of the MRI that you mentioned. Do you have that study published somewhere or is it just like a, a pilot or something? Yeah, it's, it's currently a pilot. We, we have two publications that we're dropping into submission right now. One is the IT band study that I mentioned. Uh, so we took eight knees, four with IT band syndrome, chronic, and four without. And we looked at the spacing between the lateral femoral condyle and the IT band to see what the differences were between the two and what the effects of a cup on there would be. So it's really interesting stuff. Hopefully that'll be published in the next one to two years. And then we have another one with a lumbar study looking at the pressures, like I was talking about, how much pressure does it take to affect the lumbar multifidus, right? 
which is what we think of as a deeper muscle and something that's very important when we think about chronic low back pain or mobility issues when people have low back pain. Um, and so that's one of those other areas that is very interesting. So um, again, research, if you're not involved in that world, is a very slow moving process. Um, and all of my studies are more of this ex like pilot uh, exploratory studies because if I had the perfect study with a randomized control study and I had perfect methodology for all of it, even if I got good statistically significant results, people would point a finger at me at the end of it and say, well, you yeah, have biased, so we're going to throw that study in, right? Because that's the way the research will work. So I can't do really clinical studies myself because even if I did it perfect, people would point a finger and say I have bias. And I would, right? Because I want some of these things. So there are some studies out there that are solely rolling out. I think if you're reading literature, just always look at the methodology and see if they're using motion with cups or no motion with cups. If you're using no motion with cups, you probably aren't going to see range of motion changes. If you have motion with cups, you're probably going to see more statistically significant outcomes for range of motion changes. And that's probably most of the literature that I've seen. The studies that have motion with cups, they're going to be a different type of outcome. So it's really hard because there's not enough like systematic reviews right now for those types of studies because it's a newer type approach. Yeah. Yeah. You have to start somehow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I got the ball rolling and I'm hoping other people push that, you know, big snowball down the hill. Yeah. Yeah. And what would be the best advice that you can give to clinicians that are starting their careers? Oh, absolutely. I've changed so much in my career in terms of my interests, my philosophies, I'd say just read as much as you can. You're going to get out of school as a young clinician and you'll be like, I got done with that. Like I get to coast now. Heck no. You're just starting. You're just scratching the surface. I think reading as much as you can and, and not just reading an abstract, but dive into your methodology on everything that you do. It's going to make you so much better because we take a study and we try to apply it to our patient demographics. And you got to realize that sometimes the demographics in that study don't match the people you're seeing at all. And we can't just take and use, I think we use so many blanket statements right now on social media when we're trying to bash this or say this is better than this. You have to look at what type of demographic you're treating, what type of environment that is. Like for me, an athlete care at a, in a training room, right, with professional and high level athletes is a very different model of using manual therapy than an outpatient clinic. Right? So you just have to decide what what is the stuff that you're going to read that applies to the type of things that your clientele are doing. And that's really important. That's, so I'd say read a lot and don't be afraid to change your, your mind. You know, ch Don't get so stuck in your ways that you're not going to be able to get out of the biases you set. Because at this stage of my career, I feel like I'm more questioning everything every day than I ever have. And I think that's rare in our profession. I think people get stuck in the mindset that they learned in whenever they went through their DPT program and they're going to live there for the rest of their lives. And I think that's a shame because there's so much new science exploration out there that really kind of changing your mind is what it's all about. Yeah, just I think being open to give a chance to hear the other side. I think now most people they want to be right their technique is the right one and they are doing the the best treatment so i mean i think you can get something good out of almost everything um totally well and i think that's why i, I love debating with people that are anti-manual therapy it makes me better don't be afraid to have a debate don't be afraid to talk with someone that has a completely different mindset than you as long as you're able to use rationale and some of the evidence that's out there to support what you're thinking nobody has all the answers so it's great to debate and you learn things you didn't know and you get to grow yourself and you hopefully you've changed some of those people's minds as well just hopefully like this podcast changes some people's perspective of cupping it doesn't have to be what you think cupping is it could be something totally different that's empowering the public or empowering your clientele yeah i'm learning cupping with movement because i always thought it was just passive so I think that's very, very interesting. Um, and my final questions, what personal qualities or abilities that you think are important to become a successful PT? Well, that's a good one. Um, I think if you're not at PT school yet and you're going there, or maybe if you're in PT school and it's chill and you can, you can handle it, get a customer service job at some point in your life before going into PT. 
because to like work at a restaurant, to work as a barista at a coffee shop, like if you can help people in any service, you will be a better PT because you will know how to listen, to be flexible, to flex your style. And I think that's so important. I think those are the best PTs is the people that have gone through other jobs before PT school that have prepared them for life as a human in society, wherever they're at. I think that's huge is like that general life experience and general communication with, with the public, you know, and that kind of thing, it, it goes a long way. So I, I think that's huge um, overall. Yeah. Do something else before you become a PT. You, you'll be a better one. Everybody's different and you have to learn how to deal with different personalities, different people that are stuck in their different ways. Awesome. Totally. It's like music. You know, you put music on in the clinic. Even if it's your favorite song, there's going to be someone in that clinic that thinks it's crap. And, you know, someone's one person's yuck is another person's yum and you have to respect that. It's just the way it is. Chris, if people want to learn more about you, your work, how they can find you? Yeah. So uh, social media wise, we're on Instagram at Cup Therapy. Again, C-P-T-H-E-R-A-P-Y. That's probably the easiest. We have a secondary handle now called The Strength Therapist. So all one word, The Strength Therapist, because our overall umbrella company is called Integrated Movement Health. And we offer BFR classes, so blood flow restriction classes, if you haven't taken that. Uh, running mechanics classes, so the understanding of running injuries and, and some of the running mitigation of those injuries or injury mitigation for that. Um, and then we're coming out with a new concussion management course online in the next three or four months as well. So uh, you can find all of that at cuptherapy.com. So on the World Wide Web, you can type it myofascialdecompression.com or cuptherapy.com. They both work. Awesome. Chris, thank you so much for taking the time and sharing your knowledge with us, all your years of work with coping and uh, discussing research and help us open our minds here in Horizons and considering coping as a tool for our treatment. So I appreciate it. Absolutely. I'm, it was a pleasure to talk to you. I, I love that this kind of direction of the talk went into all kinds of different applications for this tool that is just something to help facilitate and expedite your res results and outcomes. Awesome. Thank you.